Okay, this week we continue with our our theme of better things. Uh, this week is a better love. We're in Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> in the introduction, the author of our text here, he makes mention that many people incorrectly think that the best way to show love towards someone is to never make them feel uncomfortable, sad, or cause them pain. Real love desires what is ultimately best for others, and the best outcome for someone may not necessarily lead through pleasurable circumstances. The love God demonstrates towards his children compels him to do whatever is necessary to help them grow in their faith, which often includes discipline and trials. A wise Christian would ask whether it is better to always be coddled and weak or to be periodically disciplined and strong. God's love is perfect. He does not shortchange his people of affection, nor does he overly coddle them. Because he loves you perfectly, your life is radically different. So that sets us up with what we're going to be talking about in the text today. Um, nobody likes to be disciplined. Nobody likes disciplining. But it is a, it, it's just a, a fact of life. It's God wants what's best for each and every one of us. When we have to discipline our children, it's because we want what's best for them. And they don't always see it at that point, but one day they will. And you look back when we were children. We didn't like it when we got in trouble. <laughs> Some of us got in trouble more than others, probably. But, you know, none of us enjoyed that, but I think everybody can look back and be thankful for the times that they you know, didn't get their way when they did have to be corrected, when they did have to be brought in line, because it's it's never just to impose someone's will on, on another person. It's always, if it's done lovingly, it's always for their own good. So we're going to start with Hebrews 12, the first two verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we start here. Wherefore we see we are also compassed about. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, a great cloud of witnesses. Referring back to chapter 11, where we talked about last week, the the hall of faith. And everybody's looked at, I don't know how everybody else has always looked at this, but I've always looked at the chapter 11, the hall of faith, and then when you step into chapter 12 and it's talking about being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I've always thought about they, us being the witness to what they did. And, and that we were just surrounded by such a great group of people in their faith and showing what they did. But, you know, the ones mentioned last week, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Israel at the Red Sea, and at Jericho, Rahab, Gideon, David, Samuel, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus, and God, and the Holy Spirit within us were all these that were talked about in, in chapter 11. But, as he says here in our text, these witnesses lived an example, and that's the way I've always looked at it. But he says, those who finish a race early often stay around the finish line to cheer on the finishers coming in after them. And that's where we can even, I've never thought about it that way. But, this hall of faith, all of these witnesses we talked about, it's not us witnessing what they did. What's being talked about here is also them witnessing what we do. And that should give us a lot of encouragement. It should also give us a, I don't know, a feeling of responsibility of following God's will. But these folks have already done their race. They've already finished. And they're sitting in heaven watching us in our race. So how much comfort would that give us knowing that all of these faithful individuals and countless others are there cheering you and I on, cheering us on as we follow God's will, as we 
as we run the race. That's I just never had stopped and thought about the fact that it's not just us looking at what they did, but more so them watching us and being a witness to our walk in God's will. So he goes on there and he says to, that we should lay aside every weight, talking about sin, which, which easily gets in our way. So we should set aside... Runners in a race remove as much excess weight as possible since any extra weight would reduce their efficiency. It, it, if you're running a race, if you're... You, you read the stories. It's interesting to me. Maybe you all don't all read but But I've read about people hiking the Appalachian Trail. And, and you know, they're, they will pick up food along the way, but they're on the trail for many days alone and by themselves. And... They carry them weight on their back, but they're very particular about that. I mean, just a few ounces will make a huge amount of difference. And so they're shedding anything that's not necessary. If it's not necessary in the next few days for them to, to get by, there's no need to take it with you. And that's what it's talking about here. We're running a race, and there's no need for any excess baggage to be carried along with us. He says, sin is unnecessary baggage which weighs down believers in their walk with Christ. And it's not just our sins that we need to shed, but also sins of this world and politically correct sins of this world. It's, it's trying to... We don't need to live our lives and walk in God's will trying to please everybody around us, trying to please the world trying to say all the right things that whatever this week's flavor or this year's flavor is. I, I, I was reading an article this week, and, you know, we have such discussions about what's a marriage today. And I hadn't remembered and hadn't realized, but it wasn't that long ago that Bill Clinton was the President of the United States. And when Bill Clinton was President of the United States, he signed into law that marriage was between a man and a woman. And now here we are, just a few short years later, disputing that. He was simply affirming what God has said. May not have been the words that, that he was saying, but, but what he did just affirmed what God says. And now here we are, just a short time later, and we can't leave well enough alone. And, but that's the kind of baggage that we don't need to be weighing us down as we well fear is one of the worst yeah and and sins of this world and the political correct things that's what we're we're fearing what somebody else is going to think about us we're fearing how somebody else is going to accept us we're fearing unnecessary things all we don't have anything to fear if we're following god's will nothing whatsoever and <clears throat> Then he goes on to say, as a believer, Christ is your reward at the end of life's race, and his love is your motivation to endure difficulties. That right there is all we need to get through whatever. He goes on to say, Jesus, the founder and finisher of your youth, the Alpha and the Omega, dismissed the shame he endured at Calvary and followed through with the crucifixion, fulfilling the demonstration of God's love for humanity. He urges everyone. He urged the people there in that time, and he urges us today to keep our eyes on Jesus. Jesus didn't have to suffer any of this, but yet he did for his, because of his love for us. He endured the despising shame, as it said there. He endured all of that on the cross for you and I. He, he mentions here to remember that we are not alone on this journey. And all we have to do to realize we're not alone on this journey is we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have Jesus Christ and the example that he set before us. And we have that great cloud of witnesses watching us and supporting us and encouraging us. And it's, uh, it's just something we should find great comfort in. So moving on to verses 3 through 8. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. 
ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as, as unto children. My son, despisest not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So Jesus endured suffering. If he endured suffering, how much, it says here in our text, how much more might you who are adopted into God's family expect to suffer hardship? If God was willing to let Jesus suffer, if Jesus was willing to suffer, if he went through that, then us that are adopted because of our faith in Jesus Christ, why do we think God should treat us any different? Why do we think that that we shouldn't suffer as well? Why do we think we're, surely we don't think we're better than Jesus and that we shouldn't, it shouldn't be anything but just roses and joy our whole life. But, in the first, in verse 3 there, he says, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. When I was reading about this, faint, he's, he's talking about being immobile in the service of God. And that, that's troublesome when you stop and think about that. That, that we have to be careful so that we don't find ourselves immobile in the service of God. That would be you know, we, we always talk about we're seeking God's will for our lives. We're seeking what He wishes for us to do. We want God's will to be our desire and, and our focus. But to find ourselves immobile in the service of God, that would just be, that would be frightening. So we, we've got to stay attuned to what's going on. And, and then in verse 4 he says, because you haven't yet, you haven't yet given up your life. You haven't had to suffer. You haven't bled. You haven't given up your life yet for God's will. The writer of Hebrews quoted Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, which reminded the Bible student that if God loves someone, he disciplines him. God loves his children, so he chastises them. So in verse 5, we're told to not give up. Just because we're going through a season of chastisement, just because... We've done something, and we and we found ourselves being disciplined. And don't make a mistake about it. God doesn't discipline us just because. It's there's consequences to sin, and we're all sinners. And if we find ourselves being corrected by God, that's what He's telling us here. That we should be thankful that. We matter enough to God that He cares. And and not to give up. Just because you, know, you don't want your child to give up. You have to go and correct them and tell them that they've done something wrong and here's what they should have done and here's what you expect them to do. But you don't want them to give up. You don't want them to just write you off and write off living and there's nothing they can do. I can't do anything right. So I might as well... That's not what's going... It's because you care for him. It's because God cares for us. God has a work for us to do. And if we're headed down this way, we might not be headed in the right direction. So if we're going the wrong way and he needs to correct us, he'll correct us to get us headed down the right path because he has something for us. He has something better for us. In verse 6, he, he's reminding us, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son who he receiveth. God wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for love, if it wasn't for his love for us. And then in verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. As for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? He's dealing with us just like we're his own child. Just like we're his. He's dealing with us. And that should be such a great encouragement because the next verse says, if he's not doing this to you, 
if you're not being chastised, if you're not being corrected, if you're not being disciplined, that's when you should be worried. That's when you should be looking in the mirror. That's when you should be reviewing your life. That's when you should be stopping and what's going on because <clears throat> if not, it's because you're not his. You, you go through, pick anywhere. We've all been somewhere and we've seen someone not behaving like they should. We've seen someone doing something wrong. But we didn't do anything about it. Nor should we do anything about it because they're not ours. Right. Now, you might look at them and say to each other, boy, if that was mine, I'd, this is what I'd do. You might use it as a learning lesson for yourself. But if they're not yours, you really don't care about it. It really doesn't matter anything to you. It's no skin off your back if somebody else is messing up. And, you know, the, it's, it's sad to say, but that's the way God looks at the lost. If he loves the lost, and they can be brought to, they can be brought into His adopted family. It's not that they're given up on, but God's not chastising; He's not disciplining the lost because it will. They're not going to learn anything from it. They want to, They don't understand the love of Jesus, so they wouldn't understand the discipline of God. So until they have accepted Jesus Christ, God's not going to... They're not going to suffer. They're not going to be disciplined in the ways that we are. So maybe when we see that person and... We've experienced the same things, and we realize that we're being disciplined by God, but yet doesn't seem to be anything happening to them. They don't seem to be suffering. Maybe we need to take note of that. Instead of saying, it's no skin off my back, I'm not going to worry about it, maybe we need to stop and say, they may not know Jesus Christ. They may not know my Savior. Maybe I need to go share with them. Maybe they need to understand why that should be bothering them. Maybe they need to understand why I'm going through what I'm going through and why they're not. So maybe it's a wake-up call for us as well to help them. He says, No matter what challenges you face, take encouragement knowing God is dealing with you as a son. No matter what challenges we face, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, we know that we can get through it. And we know that God is dealing with us just like we're his own child, which we are. And it's morning will come. And it's not something for us to find discouragement in, but find encouragement in. To know that he cares enough about us. So 9 through 11. Furthermore, we have had our fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of the spirits and live? For they verily a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So he's, what he's saying here, we respect our earthly fathers and their discipline, so shouldn't we even more so God's? Because I mean, when it comes right down to it, when our parents, when they correct us, we might not right then at that moment, as I said, and we might not right then to their face, but do you not feel good later? they thought enough of you, that they loved you enough to make sure that you were doing right, to make sure you weren't doing something that you were going to get hurt, to, to know that they cared enough about you, to care what you're doing. And if we thought that of our parents, how much more? It says here, as imperfect as human parents might be, most children who were raised by strict parents still respected them. <coughs> I don't know anybody that was raised by parents that 
that discipline them and try to keep them down the right path, I don't know of anybody that doesn't respect their parents for that. Now, I do know some folks that don't respect their parents and don't listen to them and don't have a good relationship with them. But I think when you look into it, you find that neither one of them really cared much about the other. Neither one of them really cared about what the other was going to do or was doing. All they really cared about was themselves. And, you know, if they want to do that, fine. Let them go. Get out of my hair. Out of my mind. That's the folks that... That's scary to, to, to see somebody living with that lack of love. In verse 10, earthly fathers for a few years as best they know how. Our earthly fathers' discipline is just, I mean, it's just for a few years that we have each other. And, and of course, whether you're the one on the receiving end or the one on the giving end, you're, it's best they know how. <clears throat> but, and they're doing it. It says here, is, it says, uh, they chastened us for their own pleasure. I don't think parents discipline for their own pleasure so much as they discipline so that they can see that you're doing the right thing, so that they get you started on the right path, just like God says. But God disciplines us for our own profit, for our own good, for something that our earthly fathers could never give us. For an eternity in heaven, in, his, in God's presence, in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God disciplines us so, he, so we can share in His holiness, so that we can be in their presence. It says, if children could, be, could respect their parents in purpose as they were, it would be too much to ask the children of God to respect Him as a... It should not be too much to ask the children of God to respect Him as a loving Heavenly Father. Because of your finite understanding, you have a very difficult time trying to discern whether the pain you feel is coming from discipline from God, consequences for sin, or simply the plight you endure from living in a sin-sick world. While you may not fully understand the reasons behind why you endure suffering, you must acknowledge that for reasons known only to God, He allows His children to suffer hardships from time to time. It's living in a broken world. It's living in a sinful, broken world. Things are not always going to go our way. There's going to be struggles and difficulties in life. But whoever got stronger by not having to work through anything? It's, it's a physical reality in our bodies, and it's a, it's a reality in our, in our lives, in our will. If you don't, if you want to get strong, if you want your body to get stronger, you got to work at it. You've got to work your body. You've got to suffer. You've got to feel some pain. You got to feel. You got to do some things that's not not necessarily your favorite thing to do. It might not be what you want to do right now, but if you want the end result, it's stuff you have to work through. It's stuff you have to do. If you want to get stronger. If you want your faith to grow and to get stronger, you can't just have Jesus Christ die on the cross and say, if you accept what I did, <clears throat> this is not a prosperity gospel that we preach. It's not a prosperity gospel that God talks about. It's not going to be just lavished on us and, and we'll have such a, a joyous life with no, no problems along the way. We're going to have difficulties along the way so that we can grow in our faith. So that we can grow in our holiness. It, and we should be thankful for that. And it, we don't need to stop and analyze why we're necessarily going through this right now. For whatever the cause and whatever the reason, as he mentioned here, the end result is God knows best. And he's going to allow it. And he's going to get us through it. And we're going to be better Christians for it. Verse 11. 
Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. That's what I was talking about. He says here, does God ultimately want me to be happy or holy? <coughs> Sometimes the two are not mutually exclusive, but when it comes to goals for living, you must admit that holiness has a far more permanent outcome than happiness, which is temporary. You want things to be great today? Or do you want things to be great for an eternity? Y'all have heard about it before. Do you want to live for the dot or you want to live for the line? Our lives are just, it's like a ray. Everybody knows what a ray is. It, it starts and it extends on infinitely. And at some point along there, we're talking about the timeline of time. At some point along there, there's a little dot on that, on that line. That's our life here on earth. And the rest of it is eternity. So do we want to be happy for that little dot? Or do we want to be we want to be happy for the eternity? Do we want to live for that dot? Or do we want to live for the line? Do we want to live for, for our here and now and, and what we desire? Or do we want to live for God and for eternity? And, and what he wishes to give us. God works for your eternal holiness rather than your temporary happiness. It is never enjoyable as it, ha as it is happening, but afterward we find the peaceful living that God wishes us to have. Trust that God knows what He is doing when it comes to your sanctification. He knows exactly what you need to grow in holiness, which advances His kingdom and brings glory to His name. And I know none of us would ever think that we know better than God. <laughs> He's the creator of all. He's the creator of the universe. How could we ever think that we know better for this situation than God would? We wouldn't. Now, we might from time to time find ourselves thinking that, you know, what about this alternative? Maybe this would work good. Have you thought about this, God? Well, of course he has. <coughs> But that's not his will. He has our best at all. His intentions for us are what's best for us. As your perfect Heavenly Father, God knows exactly what you can handle and exactly what you need to maximize your potential as his child. He guides you perfectly in spiritual growth and watches as you fulfill your God-given purposes. The growth plan God has you on includes seasons of chastening since you sin from time to time. Remember, the discipline that comes from God is not based in His wrath, but is based in His love. He disciplines you because He loves you and wants you to glorify Him with your life. When you gladly walk in the paths He has laid out for you, you will find joy because you are accomplishing the purposes for which He created you. When athletes complain about hard workouts, coaches often remind them to trust the process. Christian, trust God who provides the perfect process to help you grow in holiness. It may bring discomfort, but the end result is worth every pain. The process that he has for each and every one of us is not just, we don't need to look at it as just a process for us. Because we know Jesus Christ as Savior, we have the privilege, the honor. We get to share in his holiness. We get to share in his inheritance. We get to spend an eternity with, with God in the presence of him and Jesus Christ. And what we're to do along the way, God's will, is for us to, to bring as many as, as we'll hear with us. We're not fit. When we first accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're not fit prior to that, to be in God's presence because of sin. And once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, His dying on the cross covers all of our sins, so we can now be in the presence of God. But God doesn't just leave us there. He wants us to continue to grow. He wants to mold us into something to spend an eternity with Him. And He wants others the same he wants to do the same with others. And while we're here on earth, the works that he has for us to do is a part of helping each other 
grow in holiness and helping each other be what God desires us to be. And so, just like it says in the Bible, count it all joy. When we're suffering and we're going through a season in life that seems difficult, we should count it as joy because God cares enough about us to have us go through that and to, and to gain strength from it. And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thankful, Lord. Thankful that you wish to, to help us to grow in holiness. Thankful that you think, and love enough, uh, think enough of us and to love us to not leave us as we are. To discipline us so that we can grow and become the Christians that you desire us to be. I just pray, Lord, that we will count this as joy as we go through those seasons in our life and that we seek out the opportunities that you put before us to share with those around us, to share with them just exactly what your will is for each and every one of us, to spend an eternity in the presence of you and your son Jesus. I just pray, Lord, that we do this and, and we work on this through the ministries of this church and that we reach out into our community and share with, in every opportunity that you place before us. I ask forgiveness where I fail you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.